Well, welcome everyone to the uh, sixth session of the Delaware Economic, Economic Summit and the second session today. Thank you all for coming. Not needing great introduction uh, because of his uh, reputation preceding him is Ralph Citrulla from Citrulla Morgan. Uh, Ralph has over 20 years representing uh, companies in private industry as a CPA, but, but Ralph is not just a CPA. And, and the reason why we think he's going to be a great speaker today and deliver a, a lot of topical information um, is because in addition to being a CPA, he is a businessman. He has been involved personally and also counseling a lot of clients through um, scores, uh, I would say maybe dozens, maybe scores, maybe hundreds of acquisitions and divestitures over the years, um, which enable him to give a unique perspective as to how to actually handle a mer merger and acquisition from either the side of the seller or of the buyer. So we welcome Ralph Citrulla. Thanks. Thanks for having me today, and I don't know if my presentation will be that in theory, because I'm not a public speaker, but what I am is a business person, and I am passionate about this subject. Uh, this is a way, to, I think, to take your life's work um, and correct it as well, um, in terms of the acquisition work. But, uh, my background, I've been a CPA now for about 25, 26 years, I think I stopped at 25, I actually think it's 27 now, but I'm going to stop at 25 because that would be. But I also had the opportunity about uh, 11 years ago just to partner with another person and we did a roll-up. And we did it the traditional way, we did it uh, without anybody else's money other than the bank's money. And we did 19 acquisitions over a period of nine years and we sold it in June of 2012. We grew up from about 25 people to uh, about 700 people, 24 offices around the, around the country. Um, that's not where I've done all of my M&A, but that's not where I've had kind of the personal aspect of doing M&A, because it's different when you're doing M&A for yourself than when you're counseling one of your clients. But one of these days I'm going to go back and think about and count up all the acquisitions that I've done in my career. But my guess is it's probably pushing 100, if not over 100 at this point. But it's something I'm truly passionate about. Uh, it's a way to move your business forward. And of course, at the one point in time, we want to get out. So who has uh, purchased a company? Who's considering growing by acquisition? Has anyone sold the company? Now this answer, I know I'm going to get a response. Who would like to sell the company? Right? So all hands have to go up there, right? Because we don't want to work, build a company, sweat and tears, and not sell your company one day. And unfortunately, it happens way too much. Uh, where you grow, your company, next thing you know, you're, you're older, you get sick, something happens, you're wearing all the hats, there's nothing to sell. Um, so it's really important uh, to think about the end in mind. And when we started in 2003, uh, of, of doing these acquisitions, our end goal was to sell. We had no idea that we would have 700 people at the end, um, but our goal was to sell. And everything that we built was so that it could be sold. So there's two types of uh, buyers. And I also put sellers in here. Financial buyers and sellers versus strategic buyers and sellers. And first, we're going to go through what a financial buyer is, uh, what a financial seller may be. Uh, and a strategic buyer, and then we're also going to go through what a strategic buyer is, and a strategic seller. So financial buyers, they look uh, strictly on their return on their investment. What's the return on my equity? They look for what the cash flow is going to be generated out of that business. And of course, they want to exit the company at some point in time. Buyers, that, traditionally, they're, buying, they're holding, they're, they're buying for the cash flow long term and they're going to roll it up and sell it. So you see a lot of this in private equity. Um, and traditionally, when you do sell to a financial buyer, it's a lower multiple. Because it doesn't work uh, to pay more for a company because these companies are traditionally leveraged. And you've got to pay off that debt and they've got to have the amount of cash flow to pay off that debt. Our companies that we did, every, every single one, all 19 of them were 100% leveraged. Um, so, if we got started today, or after 2008, 
I'm not sure that we could have we could have done what we've done because I think a lot has changed with the whole banking industry over the last five years with everything that's happened in 2008. Unfortunately, we got started in 2003 and we had somebody who believed in us. Um, but we didn't borrow all the money from the bank because the bank did not give us all the money. So, but we had borrowed money from the bank and from the seller. And traditionally, when you're buying small businesses, because we were buying up a lot of mom and pops, um, our biggest acquisition was $5 million, our smallest acquisition was three. And if I had to take the median, it was probably about a million six. Uh, so all small businesses generally, when you sell your business, are, are, are taking money, taking paper back. Uh, so that's the way we were able to do it, uh, by being 100% leverage. And we actually even joked about it, we were like 103% because we borrowed money to buy the receivables. Uh, so it was kind of like playing poker, right? Uh, who plays Texas Hold'em? It was all in. We're either going to be successful, or we're going to fall on our face. Unfortunately, we were successful. Who are the, oh, excuse me, the goals of financial buyers? Uh, again, it's growing cash flow, and how are they going to do that? They're going to do it through revenue enhancements, expense reduction, and creative economies of scale. So some of us in this room, I'm sure, have talked to someone that they know that has their friend or a colleague sold to a private equity, they stayed on board, and six months after private equity took it over, the company doesn't look anything like that company did six months prior. Because the first thing they do is just go out and cut everything uh, to try to get the ROI on their equity. Uh, buyers, they do extensive due diligence, both on the financials, contractual, and the market. Right? Because they're, what are they buying? They're buying their revenue stream. Um, so they're not, they're gonna kick the tires. So your books need to be in order, uh, need to be accurate, need to be complete. And going through a due diligence process is extensive. It, it, it interferes, it takes away time from you in operating your business. And as I already said, transactions are traditionally leveraged. Uh, on the private equity side, you'll see uh, at least 80% leveraged on, on average. Uh, in, our, in our case, we were 100%. Who are they? We've talked a lot about this already with private equity, venture capital, family offices, um, and high net worth individuals. Individuals who are leaving corporate America, want to buy a business, uh, they're out there buying buying the businesses, but they're gonna buy it so they can get a return on their investment in the short term, not necessarily the long term. <coughs> Financial buyers, they reduce the valuation by looking at the six Ds. So we, we talked a little bit earlier about that a lot of businesses do not sell. And it's because we get older, we get sick, we die. And the six Ds are death, disability, debt, disease, divorce, and disenchantment. So you can take a viable business, but you made a mistake along the way, and you have excessive debt, and you can't get out of it because the bank's not gonna give you any more debt, you're selling the business because you need to get out from underneath that debt. Uh, the six Ds we gotta be careful of. Because financial buyers, they will, they will dive into that. If they find that opportunity, and the, and the multiples will go, continue to go down when they know they have it. Financial sellers, so who, who watches America's Got Talent? Not one person? <laughs> really? You don't want the X, right? You never want to be a financial seller. My wife said nobody was going to watch America's Got Talent except for me. <laughs> All right. I there we go. There's one honest guy, right? Nobody watches American Idol here either, right? All right. So you never want to be a financial seller because you're not getting the full value for your business. Um, you want to be a financial buyer if you're going to be a person who's acquiring companies, but you never want to be a financial seller. Strategic buyers, who are they? It's got to fit into the company's long-term plans. So our business that we rolled up, we were, we started off as an answering service. It evolved into what I would call light call center work and fulfillment work. Um, different than what you would think of calling the credit card company, um, we're calling about your computer and that type of call center. All our all our services were high touch, high value. Thirty percent medical, thirty percent property management, 
40% of everything else. Um, so our company was purchased by a medical waste hauler. What does a medical waste hauler have to do with an answering service doing 30% medical, 30% property management, 40% other? Well, what they were doing, they, they grew by acquisition from, I think, 1992 to when we talked to them in 2012, I think they did close to 300 acquisitions. And they were buying up all these med smaller medical waste providers, um, but they were starting to saturate the U.S. market. And they're international. Uh, so what they wanted to do is, uh, in their case, vertical expansion. So they want to get close to, since they're already in the doctor's office, they're already in the hospital, well, now, now they can cross sell services. So we had to convince them. Um, why do you want to just, and it, at first, they, they, were, they took a step back because, well, you're only 30% medical, we want to be 100%. Uh, because the company they bought before us was 100% medical. Then, so why do you want to have a market this big when you can have a market this big? So we were, ended up being their platform uh, for all corporate services, not just in the medical space. Uh, they want to be close to the customer and supplier, horizontal expansion for their geographic, Product lines, eliminating competition, enhancing their weaknesses. Right? Um, who are the strategic buyers? Competitors, suppliers, customers, and then I have a question mark. And so the question mark is when we started our process in January of 2011, never thought, again, a medical waste provider would buy us. Um, just had, we just had a transaction in our firm. Um, I can't really give you the industry because it can give the company away, but publicly traded company who's having some um, slower growth uh, within their industry. And I think I can talk about that company. That company is called GameStop. It's a three billion dollar company. Um, you see them all over the place. They wanted to get out, not get out, but add and diversify the type of business that they were. So they came to our client, and they're starting to do a roll up in this specific industry. Uh, so again, this company never would have thought ever go to a company called GameStop to sell their company. It would make a lot more sense if I could tell you the industry. Uh, uh, I guess it's the cellular industry. Um, but it's retail. So another retailer is just diversifying their industry. So there's an exercise called the wagon wheel. And we did this very early in our process. And if you think of a wagon wheel, right? It's round, you got all these spokes, you got the things going all around. And what you do is you just get in a room and you start brainstorming with your management team or your owners or your advisors or all of the above. And you start thinking about who's a viable buyer of your business? What customers are going to buy our business? What vendors could buy our business? What competitors, and just keep building off of it. And you'll have, at the end, you'll have hundreds and hundreds of things. I can tell you that when we did our wagon wheel, the company that bought us, it was not on our wagon wheel, right? Because we just never imagined that. Um, but what you have to do is really just open up so anybody who does strategic planning, uh, and you all cite your management team, you just gotta open up your mind and think what is possible. What makes us more valuable in somebody else's shoes than we are just as an independent person? They will pay a higher price. Uh, I can tell you that from personal experience, but I can tell you that from all of my clients' experience. I always counsel my clients away from the financial cell. Unless they have to for whatever reason, that's six Ds. Strategic buyers will pay a higher price. And who are your strategic buyers? They're usually bigger companies, right? So if you look at the publicly traded companies, they have a model, and every company is slightly different, but they have a return on their assets that they have to get. And it's probably on average between eight and 15%. Um, and what we did over the course of negotiating is we cracked the code. We cracked, because they kept giving us bits and pieces of information. Um, and we figured out what their formula was for valuing businesses. Um, and they didn't say it outright, 
but we knew because eventually we came to the same place. Uh, why? Why do they pay a higher price? Because there's synergistic value, three times the scale. It's cheaper for them to purchase the business than to build it from scratch. Um, so we all know building a business from scratch, getting your first customer and building it is difficult. Uh, and it's expensive. Uh, Google, not Google, uh, Facebook. I think they just paid $19 billion for a company that I think they had 34 employees. Right? So I'm not sure that company had EBITDA, right? Uh, but what they bought was a threat to them, and they're either going to squash that threat, and that technology is going to go away, or they're going to implement it within Facebook. Uh, they've done two or three or four acquisitions that are just mind-boggling. They were 100% strategic. Uh, so if all of us took our money out of our pocket and we wanted to go do a strategic deal like that, it would never make sense because we would not get a return on our, on our asset nor could we ever pay for it. Uh, for these bigger companies, it makes sense. Um, customer distribution, that's why they bought us, right? We had 12,000 customers. What else did they sell to those 12,000 customers? Their services uh, and vice versa. Their clients can come into ours, our clients can go to them. Although we probably have a lot of mutual clients. Um, take better, better uh, as we just talked about uh, in Facebook. The better the fit, the higher the price we pay. So an example on that cellular company, they had an offer of $13.5 million for one company and $2 million for another company. One of the owners of the company wanted to take it and run. Uh, fortunately, that person was out of the country and I was able to work with one of the owners and we did a conference call. And it is a very uncomfortable call, and it's a lot of risk because the last thing you want to do is blow a deal for a client. So we got on the call. I did, I did the uh, my calculation how I value companies from their perspective, uh, not from the state standpoint, not from a, from a, a gifting standpoint, from their perspective. What is the return on their investment? Uh, they the buyer, or they the seller. They the buyer. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, the seller, and I can tell you, this seller I've had as a client since the late 90s, and probably no less than five times I've told them not to sell. The first time they wanted to sell, was, they wanted to sell for about $2 million back in the late 90s. Now the company was smaller, but it just it wasn't worth it. And it's always risky as an advisor to tell your client not to do something to put cash in pocket. Um, but it had to be at least five times. So when they got this offer, I said, you guys have seriously considered this offer. They were already seriously considered. They didn't, they didn't need to pay me to say that. But if they're starting there, there has to be some room. So the first thing we do, you get on the call, they're going to say, well, we really don't have much room. So it was right out of the playbook. And it was dead silence. And it was me at my desk, my client across my desk, and silence. And if the one owner was there, he probably would have said, all right, we'll just take the 13. And we joked about it at the end. They were able to move that number to 17 and a half. Plus the two, they moved to four and a half. In a matter of a week. It wasn't months, it wasn't years, a week. I was down buying furniture in Laurel, Delaware, and I'm getting a call on a Saturday. My wife's looking at me, yelling at me. And we're trying to get this deal done because then a second buyer came in. So anytime you can get a second buyer in, we'll talk about an auction process a little bit later. Then obviously the value goes up. This was a huge, unbelievable fit for GameStop. Um, multiples didn't matter to them. They didn't look at the multiple either. Because the multiple wouldn't make sense. And none of us in this room would make sense to buy that company for that price. Um, as, as a seller, you always move the discussion away from multiples into what the strategic value is. Um, we had to do it with our investment banker on our, our deal. He kept going, well, that's too big of a multiple. It was like, we, we hired you because you said you didn't talk about multiples. You said you do all strategic deals. And he, he had to, you know, every time he had to stop himself, you know, we're not going to talk about multiples. 
change the conversation uh, to what your value is to them. Due diligence is secondary. This deal that I just talked about in the cellular industry, they agreed to terms uh, first week of March, they closed March 31st, there was zero financial due diligence. Zero. Only, that one was zero. The only thing they looked at was the commission reports from their provider. That's it. In the contract. So there's some contractual due diligence, but that's it. Uh, Strategic values. <clears throat> Low place more value on your competitive advantage in your business than you ever will place. Uh, and my partner in the call center, he was that guy. Because sometimes I do, I, I, I just, I'm on the left side of that line and I'm acting as a traditional CPA, I'm like, who's going to pay that number? But he pulled me over and said, hey, it's strategic. We've got 12,000 customers. What else can we sell to those 12,000 customers? What else can somebody else sell? They know your products. They know your area. They want your management. They want your IP. That's what Google bought, right? I mean, excuse me, Facebook. And customers. They place more value on that than you. So, what's, so everybody should go back and ask their, their clients or themselves, what is your strategic value to a large investor? That's like a million dollar question, hopefully the 10 million dollar question. Uh, that's what you have to think about when you're looking to exit or as you're building your company. And the key is, the key to value is making you valueless, you as the owner. So I stayed on board for three months, my partner stayed on board for seven months, and that was it, we were out. And staying on board, I didn't do anything. And my partner had a few meetings and that was it. Uh, an entrepreneur who wears all hats is not going to be able to sell this unique value, because there's no magic to it, it's just you. So this is what you want to do. You want to position yourself so that you sell directly to the strategic buyer. Because what is private equity doing? You're doing the roll up, right? And then what are they doing? They're going to go sell to somebody from a strategic buyer standpoint. And it's essentially what we did. We weren't private equity, but we did 19, well, we did 19 acquisitions, and we had, we had a parameter of how we're going to value companies our bank is behind us. And as long as we stayed within those parameters, the bank kept giving us money. And if we went outside those parameters, which we did, we had to explain why. And there was a couple strategic deals that we did, even at that scale, although we didn't have to pay the crazy amount, but we had to raise what we would normally pay in the industry. Partly because there was more buyers coming in, and that was starting to raise the price. But position yourself to sell directly to strategic investors. So this slide, think of your business as one of those circles on the left. It's an independently owned business. You've got all your financial buyers in the middle who you don't want to sell to. You've got all your strategic buyers in all different shapes and sizes. How does your company fit into one of those, those pieces? That's where we want to move our company. We had another transaction in March, another significant transaction. Uh, in uh, light manufacturing space. Um, and they were originally, they, had, they were closely going to sell them back in September. Um, and I will come back to that later on in another slide. Uh, and I was by strictly a fund. I was going to do a roll up. And the multiple was real good at the front end when they started negotiating on the LOI. By the time they got through due diligence, they got back to the financial <coughs> the He sold to a different fund, but he's getting participated going forward. So 
So even though he sold to a, a second fund, he got he didn't get necessarily 100% strategic value, but he's going to get 100% strategic value then because he's going to participate in the eventual rollout because he's the platform company. But position yourself to figure out where you fit. Uh, doesn't have to be in the middle. Doesn't have to be the core business. It could be a fringe. It could be something you're adding. Again, call center, medical waste caller. I don't think there's, if there's, there's probably more extremes, but that's as extreme as it gets. Maximize, maximizing your value to the small companies. It'd be perfect if we had five companies that one of us, right? So when you sell a house, and you just have one person who makes an offer. <coughs> The seller really doesn't have a lot of value. It doesn't it has a lot of leverage to take the offer. Maybe you negotiate a little bit. But when you have a whole bunch of people come through your house and you have multiple offers, you have a lot more leverage. And it's the same thing with selling your business. Trying to get two to five. And I can, I'll be honest, we had one. We had one other than private equity. And we played it to say that there was more. Uh, so we got a lot to do. need to have more than one strategic buyer. And the reason why the company this, and the seller company was able to increase that is because another player came in. So we had two. And you start off, is, is this a strategic acquisition for you? And if it's not, then we don't want to talk to them. Are they experienced and committed enough to support the integration. Because if they can't do integration, they can't support the organization, because you gotta do due diligence on that buyer. The third point is tricky. Because nobody wants to be thought of as you're using me to get higher value from this person. So it's a slippery soap. But the person who you really want to sell to, well, no, you're going to give them the last look. Because they know that this is your destiny, right? They know that you're trying to get the absolute highest value for your company, for all the work and sweat and tears you're going to But it's a slippery slope. You can't use that all the time with all your buyers because they talk. Leverage value up by sharing parameters of parts of your business. What aspect of your business? is valuable to them. And I can talk about it a little bit in general. But who uses Salesforce.com? Nobody? Well, Salesforce.com started as a customer relationship management software, right? Used in the sales capacity. Follow up with all your leads and your closes. Well, we use it as our back-end operational engine, from IT tickets to sales to accounting, everything. We did a demo of what we did with Salesforce. And it's totally overhead because I didn't know how to use it. Um, but that adds tremendous strategic value because we spent tons of money to build that uh, and perfect it. It would have taken them a long time to do what we did because it took us five or six, seven years to do that. Um, and it was an ongoing thing. That just strictly operational tool, and nothing to do with the customer per se, added value to our company. The other thing we had is we had a video. Back to your office tonight, um, we did a lot of video. And, and go to YouTube and, and, and uh, put in Apple Tree, and um, I haven't done it in a while. Um, I don't know company. It's a um, it'll come to me. I'll Google before we get out of this meeting. Um, and you watch this nine minute video and you'll have a tear in your eye. Um, and that video that cost us almost nothing uh, added value to our company. Again, nothing to do with the customer, but everything to do with the culture of the organization. And allow the relationship to develop. Because as we heard earlier, people like doing business with people they know. 
So these are things to think about when you're selling. Always be prepared. Financials, governance, tax, compliance, every aspect. Be prepared. Because when they come into due diligence, you need to be prepared. And there's too many deals that get blocked at the 11th hour because there's a surprise because we weren't prepared. Talk about owner's value needing to be minimized. Value should be based on the business, not the owner. Because you're selling the business, you want to get out of the business. So get the value away from you. All owners have to be on the same page. In the example I talked about the seller company, one wanted, thought they could get more, and one thought no. Fortunately, that one that said no was out of town, and we were able to get an incredible more value to them. But you got to have one voice. So when we were out uh, in Illinois talking to the buyer, they both came to us, the CFO, the business development guy, the acquisition guy asked John and me separately, what do you, what do you got, what role do you want in the future organization? And we said exactly the same thing in different places. If we add more value by staying, we'll stay. If we don't add any value by staying, then we don't need to stay. We don't need to stay. It's just one little example, but you have to be on the same page. So even when you make management decisions, right? We may disagree within this room. But when you walk out that door, you've got to make sure you're great. And it's the same thing when you're selling your business. It's more important because they will, they find a weakness, they will penetrate that weakness. Run the business like you're not selling the business until that wire hits that account. Uh, and a lot of times we get distracted by selling our business. The next thing you know, the deal doesn't go through and we have a mess on our hands because we got distracted. You have to run your business like it's not gonna sell. And we did that right up until the last day, right up until the last hour. Win the war, not the battle. We don't have to win every argument, from evaluation to contractual, to what the value of this segment is. Win the war, the overall war, not the battle. My partner pounded that in my head multiple times when we were doing some acquisitions. Um, I'm thick headed, so it took a while, but I get it. Win the war, not the battle. We should live by that as we run our business, whether we're selling it or not. Hire an advisor to negotiate some deals. You're going to sell, most times, as a business owner, you're going to sell one business in your lifetime. On our case, Company bought us did 300 acquisitions. We were a little different animal. But think of the think of the call center who's selling to them, who's going to sell one business, um, and they've done 300. Where's the you know get on the seesaw? Where is it? Right. So get an advisor who is going to be able to balance that out. Somebody who knows your business, who has negotiated, um, because they'll take advantage. And don't get emotional. I'm an emotional guy. My partner in the CPA firm, she knows, and I'm very emotional. I make some emotional decisions. You can't get emotional. So, the light manufacturing company that I told you did not go through back in September, I told them when the process started, I said, You and your wife need to sit down and draw a line in the sand because at the end of due diligence, they will come back and start chipping away. And you don't want to get so far down the path that you're emotionally into this, right? Because they're still flashing a big number. And it's a, it's a high risk. And that deal, and they cut the deal down from 24 to 20, and you said, no. 20 million, right? It's a lot of money. You live the rest of your lifetime, a couple lifetimes in that. And he said, no. And I felt horrible. I felt like I gave him bad advice. Because that was a life-changing event, $20 million. And I saw him out at lunch one day, <laughs> talking to his wife, and I said, I feel hard. But I gave that advice. And I said, I'm crying with them, I said, don't feel hard. So the other one started percolating, he's like, it's good advice. I didn't make an emotional decision to go forward, and I ended up getting my number. And more, because he's going to be able to get the second piece, the second bite of the number. Don't get emotional. 
And it's easier said than done. Because when somebody's flashing money that's going to change your life, with financial security for your family, it's a really emotional item. I can't tell you. So many people just go through the transaction because they have to at that point. They're, they're emotionally done. How about when you're buying? I know I spent a lot of time on the selling side of it, but I think you can build a business through buying. I did it, and, and a lot of people do it. Again, be prepared. Have good financials, governance, tax compliance. You need to have your source of funds in place. You might not have the LOI, the letter of intent from the bank, but you have to have it committed. Just say one one quick story. Uh, so our second transaction, uh, uh, we did a small transaction in Florida. We come back, the transaction that we were bidding on did, fell through, and they said we want to bid on it. We ended up bidding on it and getting it. And again, we didn't really have anything at that point. Uh, and I called our banker and I said, you think we can get this, this deal done? Uh, he's like, yeah, no problem. So we, we went up to Maine, we did the due diligence, and I called him, I said, our money goes hard today if we, if we leave. He's like, no, that's done. So Wednesday, I'm walking in to play golf after work, um, and he calls me and says, the deal's off. Head of credit squashed him. He's like, who's the head of credit? And he told me, I, like, I didn't know at the time. We actually know each other very well now. Uh, he's a big supporter of our firm and, and of me. Um, I said, we're going to meet him tomorrow morning with him. And, and he's like, no, we can't. We have exactly meeting. I was like, how about Friday? He's like, no, we got exactly the meeting. I was like, like, how about 7 a.m.? So my first success was getting my partner up, because he's a late riser, I'm an early riser, and getting three bankers into the into the bank at 7 a.m. And me and John were prepared. We went with them to say, if we get in trouble, what, what's going to happen? How do you get out of this? And it ended up being, we found out later that it was a courtesy of me because I was a good friend of the bank. And I was a good partner. It was supposed to be a 15 minute meeting. But then Glenn's secretary kept coming in and said, Glenn, your next call, your next meeting. And he kept pushing her side, we there three hours. This is Friday morning, we're supposed to close on, on, on uh, Tuesday. And uh, we were borrowing 800,000, it was a million dollar transaction. And we were there for three hours. We were prepared. John talked all about the operational and marketing side. I talked all about the financials. And we both talked about how you get out if you get in trouble. By the time we left Market Street and got down to Delaware Avenue, we got a call and said, everybody here at uh, 4 o'clock on Monday to sign. And at that point, we were just trying to get 300000 to close on a deal, but the seller was in trouble. Um, and they said no for the whole thing. And that's literally what wants to know me. The credibility with the head of credit of the bank sold us. And he became our cheerleader in the, in the future years. Uh, and uh, loan committee. Head of credit, guys. I love this guy, but they're more boring than us CPAs, right? He was our cheerleader. He he was a vocal supporter of us. Uh, and in the end, because of probably that one meeting and everything that we did subsequent, they ended up giving us a $15 million acquisition line of credit, which meant that. If I found a deal tomorrow, I can go kick the tires the next day and email the bank and say, here's the parameters, and you wire the bank money. And it was literally that simple. Uh, when I talk about that, when other bankers around they said it's not possible. And it was possible. It didn't happen overnight. We didn't get the, <laughs> it, that, that took about six years to get that type of acquisition line of credit, but they came to us about four years and gave us about four million dollars line of credit. Uh, but as long as you do what you say you're going to do, have your numbers prove in and prove out. Educate your bank. You get the right banker, they're going to support you. I'm not saying all banks will. Certain banks you, you're not going to go to for a transaction like that. I would never go to a TD bank. Uh, not because I don't like them, because I do do business with them. But I would never go that, to that type of transaction. If I have a AAA deal, I take that to TD bank. But ours wasn't AAA, ours was leverage. Right? So you got to go to a little bit more of an entrepreneurial bank. We have our source of funds. That was a competitive advantage over every single buyer that was out there. 
was we could close tomorrow. That was powerful. If we could offer less to get the deal done because the money's going to be in their account. Get the seller out of the business, and I say most cases because it's not all cases. Uh, I can tell you, in every single one of our transactions, except for one, we got the owner out of the business immediately. Because why? Because the owner still wants to run the business the way they ran the business. The employees are still going to run to that person. And say, oh, they're changing this, that. And in one case, we did, and it was our largest acquisition, and it was a disaster. And we got rid of that person in about six months. So we're, we're believers, I'm a believer, get the owner out of the business as soon as possible. Don't lose sight on your current business. Again, whether you're selling your company or, or buying a new other company, you cannot lose sight of operating your own company. Because the last thing you want to do is go close the transaction, and next thing you know, you come back home and your, your business is a mess. Um, have an integration team. And our integration team started with me, and then our integration team through to uh, probably about 10 people that we would send. From HR, to marketing, to IT, uh, to sales. Uh, so we had an integration team. We integrated immediately. There's an example, we bought one down in, North, uh, down in Louisiana. At that time, we were doing a video campaign. All the offices uh, were doing a video of their office. Literally, we bought that transaction on, on August 1st, and they don't remember the year. By the second week, uh, second or third week of all of it, that group had a video on it. That just happened to be the time when we were doing the videos at all, everybody's office. But they put, they put a video together, no professional help. And it was the old logo, and then the new logo coming up, and then them having apple tree shirts. And it was, it was powerful, right? Because our integration work, we got them engaged in our company immediately. And we took our best practices and implemented it. But we also found out what their best practices were, because we didn't have all, all the right answers. We took their best practices and implemented it to all our other practices. Last two are the same. Win the war, not the battle. Don't get emotional. We got emotional on one transaction. It's in 2006. We bought one in West Memphis, Arkansas. And then we tried to buy one in Memphis, Tennessee. They were 10 miles apart. So very right, strategic, right? We can close up one office, save all this money, and put it together. But when I do due, due, due diligence, it was a mess. And I remember coming back and telling the integration team, there's gonna be a lot of work here on, on the operations to get, get the scripting right, and no one was heavily involved. A year later, we sold. We packed stuff up West Arkansas, uh, excuse me, West Memphis, Arkansas, Memphis, Tennessee, and sold it for about $300,000 loss, and it's the best thing we did. And we were afraid to call the bank, and when I did call the bank, I thought he was going to yell and scream at me. And, and he was like, he was like, it's going to take you more time and money to fix it. That was a smart decision. It wasn't our first transaction, so we had a lot, you know, we had some uh, cloud behind us. But I thought they were going to be upset, and they weren't. Um, so we got emotional about one, and we made a mistake. Let's take some questions. What's your feeling about um, selling before you're ready to avoid the financial debt? So, for example, you know, you, everyone envisions this, all the clients that we work with. I'm going to turn 65 and sell my business, walk off into the sunset, and do a lot of things that I'm going to do. my kids, my grandkids, and that's it. Doesn't always happen, it never happens. Right. Um, so, you know, what if, what if somebody comes along at 40, 45, 50, you know, can Sit on it. How do you make that determination? And you make a determination on how it's going to change your life and the value that you're going to get. And if you think of your clients, your clients are a lot like our clients, right? They're entrepreneurial. So they're going to sell and go start life. So I think if the value is right, you have to take it. Because uh, sometimes the cash doesn't come back. But don't sell it if the value is not right. So if this transaction for us didn't work out, we would not have sold to clients or buyers. There was no reason to. We would have, stayed, we would have kept, kept on going, forging ahead. Um, 
So I, I, it's it's a hard decision until you. And every every case is going to be individualized. So that personal personal situation. Uh, you know, maybe they're leveraged on the outside and they're selling for a little less. I mean, there's just so many things that I think affect that decision about selling a company. I mean, you never want to get to the six Ps. But if you get to your 65th birthday and say, okay, I'm going to sell it before my 66th birthday, that's a horrible decision. If you're going to sell it, sell that business, you should be at least thinking about it at 60. But I really think you should be thinking about it today. Whether you're 40 or 50, Whatever age you are, you should be building that business with the intent to sell. And when the right offer comes across, like the seller company, they've had tons of offers through, through the 15, 16 years that I've worked with them. They said no every single time. It was not right. It was not the right value. Um, now they got a number that changes their life. They can choose to work, they choose not to work. So uh, it's a tough, a tough call to generalize it because every, every situation is different. But I think when you get the right value, at the time I was, it was actually, we actually sold my birthday, so it was, I turned 46 that day, and my partner was 42. So, uh, long work, like that, right? Uh, because you know, there's a lot of things on our horizon that could have hurt us. This healthcare law would have killed our business. Even though we provided healthcare, we would not have met the 9%. Because we had a lot of low cost employees. Uh, we would have killed our business. And then there's another thing that you'll see in the phone bill, something called the universal service fee. It's probably two or three or four dollars in your cell phone bill on your home phone or whoever has a home phone at this point in time. So think of what it costs now, right? We got tons and tons and tons of trunks coming in. And there was, and I, and I don't know the technology, but one T1 was costing X dollars. But if this universal service fee went through to go through all those lines, it was going to cost us like another sixty, seventy thousand dollars a month. It doesn't put us out of business, but it sure affects the value of the company. So we had some things on the horizon that affected our decision, uh, besides just the value uh, that we received. Ralph, you just mentioned two things. Uh, Increased employment costs through the ACA, and, and I guess this is um, going to increase regulatory costs, for example, with the Trump fee. But, but in the last few years, what have your buyers, or what contract terms in the actual documents have you seen a shift in, in terms of whether it's you know, dealing with employment issues, dealing with regulatory issues, dealing with other issues that you're seeing? What sort of contract language are you starting to see a lot of people? Assisting upon, I guess more so from the buyer side, but if there's more language identification perhaps or insurances, things like that, that the buyers are looking for as well. What are you seeing in terms of changes to the? Yeah, and again, I don't do agreements. Uh, I do read them, um, but I mainly focus on uh, financial reps and warranties and the financial aspects of the deal. Um, but there's a difference after again 2008, right? It's, there was a lot of M&A activity through 2008, and we actually have a small intermediary company where we prepare companies for sale and broker them, and we pulled a couple companies off in 2008 because the market conditions weren't there. Uh, so back then, I think the, the, the seller, prior to 2008, the seller had a little bit more leverage. So the, uh, the reps and warranties, the hold back money, or the charge back money that you can go back after, was not as strong. What you saw in 2008, 9, 10, it was really strong in the buyers because there wasn't as many buyers at that point in time, right? The private equity money was drying, drying up. Uh, uh, the public traded companies, what they were doing, they were streamlining to, uh, in terms of you know, ridding costs to up their bottom line. They weren't growing. But now, since probably 2011, 12, 13, the M&A activity, activity has really ramped up. Um, I don't have the statistics, but I know it's, it's ramped up significantly. So it's starting to get balanced a little bit. But buyers are smart, uh, and they want to make sure that they're protected. They're, they're, they're going to get the rest of warranties that are going to protect their industry. But again, it's a give and take, right? You don't have to win 
every single argument on every single record warrant. Uh, where's your exposure? Try to win on that. Where you have very little exposure, you give them a, give them a win. So it's just a little give and take. But I think it's starting to get a little bit more balanced where it was in the buyer, uh, uh, buyer's uh, side prior to 2008, seller side for the next two or three years, now I think it's getting a little bit more balanced. Uh, and then it also comes down to how strong is the seller? Uh, fortunately, both clients that I had to sell this year, they were really strong. Uh, and, uh, and one, because the number increased so much, they were afraid the deal was going to pull apart. So they actually didn't even push that hard enough somewhere. So they had very little risk. And the attorney was like, you call me, they're like, oh, what am I supposed to do here? I'm like, this is this industry. Uh, this is where they bought companies. This is where they, they sold bits and pieces. This is the way it works. Um, and there's a little risk. Uh, so I think, think that, again, it comes down to individual deal um, and the circumstances, you know, how strong the buyer is, how much the buyer wants that, that, that target. Um, our transaction, our deal was almost dead. Uh, we were supposed to close on May 31st. And I can't remember what today was, that was. We backed up. I think it was Friday. That was a Thursday. We had tons of points in the agreements that weren't done. And we were dealing with counsel on, on, the, on the other side. And I dealt with a lot of counsel. Uh, and, excuse me. And when I crossed the T's, the doctor, I said, looks the way they want to do it, right? Uh, but this guy, he was in house counsel. He wasn't out at, you know, counsel from the firm. And he was a hindrance to the deal. We literally, we flew. Uh, me, my partner, the pilot, so we just jumped in his plane, flew, flew out to Illinois with our attorney uh, and our investment banker. Um, sat in the room with the CFO, uh, business, uh, uh, business development guy, the m &A guy, and his attorney to try to get this deal done. And we made that way. And we're working through all the more of the weekend trying to get the transaction. It's still nothing. Uh, so then, on Monday, it was June 4th, we had to have a six hour conference call. This is the day we are closing. We have 30 managers from around the country, maybe more, 50 managers waiting <laughs> at Hotel DuPont for this announcement. Uh, and if it wasn't for the CFO of the company, we'd be able to that uh, And we had to give them a really big point. They were just really, really stubborn on it. Um, and we were stubborn too. Uh, but I guess it just depends on the strength of the buyer and the seller. Um, what kind of rate of return range do you look for? As a buyer? So when, I, so, so when I represent <coughs> buyers, right? right? So when I represent buyers, what do we want to do? We want to do the financial right. buyer, right? Because my clients cannot afford to do a strategic buyer. Right? Okay. They, they don't have stock that they can give as part of the purchase price of this you know, monopoly money. So, uh, from a public trade, when I'm dealing with a public trade company as a buyer, I, I, I target anywhere from 8 to 15. Um, and if we have questions, to try to figure out where they are. Uh, from a public trade company, I'm dealing with a public trade company as a buyer, I target anywhere from 8 to 15. And I think if you really dig down into the financials, you can probably find it. Uh, and the, and for the, um, the, the, the buyers, Range was buyer. So again, it depends on the industry and the type of business. Yeah. I can tell you what our range was. Mm -hmm. Our range was three or four times even what we tried to buy it for. Uh, and then we also had another uh, uh, multiple. These are rules of thumbs, and I hate rules of thumbs, but for us, it was 12 to 18 times monthly recurring revenue in that industry, right? Uh, but I think most private sales, so one individual buying another company or a smaller company buying another company, you gotta keep the multiple below five unless you have to have a lot of capital to put into that because it, it won't finance uh, unless you have a tremendous amount of cash flow over in your existing company. What can you charge? I do, I do two, two different things. Uh, so certain times I just bill traditionally on an hourly basis and my hourly rate is $300 an hour. Um, but on the sales side, I try to be successful. And, and that's a negotiated thing. Uh, 
it could be as high as 12% of a of the deal value above a certain number. It could be as low as four or five percent. How do you farm buyers? Uh, we, I work through, uh, because I'm not in the business full time, so I don't have my database of buyers. Uh, but depending on who you are, uh, and sometimes I get involved when they already have the buyer, but I'll use other folks distribution network and you put together an executive summary and that's what you're using the peak entries. But I use other folks as distribution network. Or somebody locally or even regionally uh, will call these companies to see if they're interested. We are not a company who I'm sure every company here has got a faster fax machine as I have a buyer for your company. We don't do that. I would put up a phone call from uh, a prospective uh, uh, buyer who I think this might be a good fit for. Kind of retail stuff, uh, or retail transactions, smaller transactions, there is a website out there called BizBuySell. So if you're looking at buying a business, uh, you can go and search by industry, and geographical area, I think you can go by price as well. It's BizBuy, Biz, B-I-Z, uh, BuySell.com. I've never put a company on there to sell, um, but I have looked on that website to try to find other targets to buy. Um, this is kind of more of an operational question, I think, but say you've done a really good job at not wearing a lot of hats as an owner, and you've built a well-established management team that's really effective, and your strategic buyers get a lot of value in that. What are some things you've seen as the owner then trying to convince those people to stay, because I can imagine that's one of the things that's more outside of your control. Yeah, but you have to get engaged in that, right? Uh, so our management team is very important to the transaction, and we allocated a portion of our purchase price uh, for a non-compete that they had to sign from the seller. The seller didn't fund it, we funded it. Uh, so again, most people in your management team are not gonna walk away money that they can just go sit on the beach and right, drink uh, pretty drink with an umbrella, right? So they need a job. So that's one part. But there's other parts is that some people don't want to work with a big company. Uh, yeah. So uh, they did a great job from their standpoint. They gave them all the options. Um, and then we funded the, the non-repeats for that. So again, it's going to happen differently, but uh, try to get them a good employment agreement. Company. We didn't have employment agreements for our company, but we try to get them an employment agreement where we do go, especially when it's a key person. And the buyer wants to lock them up too. So they don't want to lose it. Well, I want to express my gratitude to Ralph and Shirley. Before we do, I want to uh, remind everybody that at 11.45, Dave Tiberi is coming to speak to the group. Um, at this afternoon, there is a discussion about personal insurance and estate planning plan for tomorrow and Friday as well. So thank you very much, Ralph, for your presentation.